My name is Erwin Chemerinsky. I'm a professor here at Duke. This is my second year on the faculty. I came here after 21 years on the faculty at the University of Southern California Law School. I'm just thrilled to be a part of the Duke faculty. And it's an honor and pleasure to be here this morning with my colleague, Neil Siegel. Neil also joined the Duke faculty last year in his second year here. He came here right after clerking for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the Supreme Court. And before that, Judge Wilkinson on the Fourth Circuit, a graduate of Bolt Hall School of Law, both a law degree and a PhD. And he's one of the best parts of Duke Law School from my perspective. Um, I was told to say at the very outset that if you haven't yet picked up your packet for CLE credit, you should do so. And there's one outside, so you can be sure to get the hour of CLE credit. And as advertised, what we'd like to do for the next hour is talk about the Supreme Court. And we welcome your comments as we go along, and certainly we'll save time for questions at the end. From 1994, when Harry Blackman retired from the Supreme Court, he was replaced by Justice Stephen Breyer until July 1, 2005, when Sandra Day O'Connor resigned from the Supreme Court there wasn't a single vacancy. This was the second longest stretch in American history, and the longest since early in the 19th century, without a vacancy on the Supreme Court. Now, of course, there are two new justices on the Supreme Court. Justice Byron White, who served on the court for so many years with distinction, said, every time there's a new justice, it's a different court. That's especially true with two new justices. I don't think that replacing William Rehnquist with John Roberts as Chief Justice is likely to change results from the court. Last summer, I had the occasion, as did many law professors, of reading literally dozens of memos, briefs, and opinions written by John Roberts. In almost every area of constitutional law, his views seem identical to those of the justice for whom he clerked, William Rehnquist. The real change in having Roberts rather than Rehnquist as chief justice is going to be in the long term. John Roberts was 50 years old when he was sworn in as chief justice last fall. If he remains on the court until he's 86 years old, the current age of Justice John Paul Stevens as of yesterday, then John Roberts will be on the court into the year 2041. That means for probably most of us in this room, though I guess not necessarily for Neil, John Roberts is going to be Chief Justice throughout the rest of our careers. The real change in results from the court is going to come from Samuel Alito replacing Sandra Day O'Connor. Again, like many law professors, I had the occasion of reading for a couple of hundred opinions written by Samuel Alito as a judge on the Third Circuit. I even had the occasion of testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee about Samuel Alito's nomination, based on what I learned. And what I saw was that Samuel Alito is a very conservative judge, in many areas clearly more conservative than Sandra Day O'Connor was as a justice on the Supreme Court. And if you focus on the most controversial areas of constitutional law. In almost all of them, the Supreme Court in recent years has been split five to four with Justice O'Connor in the majority. So if you talk about abortion rights, affirmative action, civil rights litigation, federalism, <laughs> presidential power, separation of church and state, it's easy to foresee in all of these areas, even in the relatively near future, a major change in constitutional law. My guess is we're not going to see much of it this year. This is an unusual term of the Supreme Court. Sandra O'Connor remained a justice until January 31st, 2006. She participated in the oral arguments in cases in October, November, December, and January. But she and her colleagues knew she could only participate in decisions if she's on the court the day the decision came down. So the result, this year is unusual that there were a large number of unanimous Supreme Court decisions on very narrow grounds. 
I think this is so the justices could resolve the case without needing to put it over for re-argument. I think it's especially next year and the years ahead that we'll really see the importance of the shift from Justice O'Connor being the swing justice to Justice Kennedy being the swing justice to having Justice O'Connor's seat taken by Samuel Alito. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you folks and to welcome you, uh, welcome you back to Duke. I apologize for the weather, but I think like the rest of us, the heavens had to take a step back and cry uh, when, the dean, when the dean made her announcement, but I think the future is, uh, is very bright. It's uh, especially uh, a joy for me to bring you folks in on the conversation. And by the conversation, I mean the daily back and forth between our offices, uh, between Erwin and me, talking about the Supreme Court. Um, it's one of the uh, greatest pleasures I, I have being here, and I sense Erwin feels the same, though I can't be entirely sure, because every time he comes in my office, he sticks his hand in the candy jar that I leave there for my students. <laughs> and so uh, it's very hard to prove purpose in constitutional law. It's not clear what his purpose is in being there. I, I, agree, I agree in general uh, with, with, with everything that, that, that Irwin said. I think uh, we live in interesting times, and that's, uh, that's uh, <laughs> I think the Chinese proverb is intended to be both, uh, both to get people's attention and to, uh, and to be a curse. Uh, I think uh, we, you're going to see dramatic changes in the Supreme Court in the years to come. I think one way of just summarizing it is that between 1995 and 2006, the court decided almost 200 cases by a 5-4 margin. In a whopping 77% of those cases, Justice O'Connor was in the majority. In all the areas that Erwin mentioned and in many others as well, no other single justice on the Rehnquist Court has had that kind of influence. And I think just like many people called the Warren Court the Brennan Court, uh, the Rehnquist Court could justly uh, be, called, be called the O'Connor Court because of that influence. I think switching, um, I should say that I, I had the, the, the privilege of working for some of the, the senators on the Judiciary Committee for both of the past, the past nominations. And I agree in general that, that replacing Chief Justice Rehnquist with Chief Justice Roberts is not going to make a huge difference in the law. The reason I say in general is that because individuals are individuals, and you never know, and there are always surprises. I think people within the court, let alone outside, were shocked when Justice Scalia uh, came down on the side of civil liberties in one of the big terrorism cases that was before the court the year I clerked there. It was an hour decision. It was exceptional. In every other case, he's been very strongly on the side of the government. But still, there are surprises. Um, John Roberts is much younger than Chief Justice Rehnquist was. His views about gender, about homosexuality, about race are likely to be somewhat different. I don't think it's going to make a significant difference across the board, but I do think it may make some difference. I also think that John Roberts has a political savviness about him um, that perhaps the last Chief Justice didn't, um, at least to the, extent, uh, to the extent that John Roberts does, and that may also impact some of the decisions. That said, in general, there's not much of a switch there, except now you have a chief who's who's 30 years younger. I think the real impact is Justice Samuel Alito. And you never know. It always involves reading tea leaves. But I think the evidence is as strong as it could be that uh, Justice Alito is going to be a reliable, uh, very conservative vote on the court, by which I mean aligned much more often than not with Justice Scalia, with Justice Thomas. Um, I think that's the real impact. And those five fours in many areas, from abortion to affirmative action to campaign finance to religion to race conscious redistricting, you can go on and on, the death penalty, I think you're going to see significant changes in the year to come. What we'd like to do is to focus on four areas of constitutional law, federalism, criminal procedure, the First Amendment, and fundamental rights. And we'll take turns presenting to you our thoughts of what the court's been doing the last couple of years and where it's likely to go, and then respond to each other. As I say, you should feel free at any point to ask questions or make comments, and we'll save time at the end for that as well. Neil's going to start with federalism. Right. So federalism has been called uh, the oldest question of constitutional law. On the one hand, the Constitution is one that gives the federal government limited powers, limited enumerated powers. And the enumeration seems to suggest that the federal government has powers that are something short of everything. On the other hand, when you look at the enumerations, especially in combination in a modern integrated national economy, it seems like there's an awesome amount of power that the Constitution 
confers to the federal government. In the last couple of terms, the court has had to deal with this issue in the context of the Commerce Clause, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3, allowing Congress to regulate commerce among the states. Uh, one case that's very timely to talk about today in light of the FDA's uh, announcement in yesterday's New York Times that medical marijuana doesn't serve any uh, legitimate medical purpose is Gonzalez against Raich. The medical marijuana case decided uh, last term, and I should say I had uh, the, the opportunity to bring my Duke Law class to the court to hear the oral arguments in Gonzalez against Raich. And I think that was a great experience uh, for them and for me. The court in that case held that federal drug law was within the scope of Congress's commerce authority as applied to the local cultivation and use of marijuana in states allowing that activity for medicinal purposes. California and 10 other states have medical marijuana exceptions to their drug laws. The federal government, federal drug law does not. And in deciding that the federal law was constitutional and thereby trumped the state laws to the contrary, the court relied on a decision that I think everyone in this room who went to law school studied. That's the 1942 decision in Wickard against Filburn. If you remember, farmer Filburn went beyond his wheat quota in order to feed his family and his livestock. And the court held that Congress can penalize him for that, still regulate that non-commercial activity, that domestic activity, because to not regulate it would undermine an overarching valid federal regulatory program. Specifically, the court had in mind the Agricultural Adjustment Act's price supports for wheat. 20% of the national production came from such home consumption, and the court didn't want that sort, uh, that sort of production and consumption domestically to undermine the price supports. Similarly, Justice Stevens said for the six justices uh, in the majority, actually five, Justice Scalia concurred uh, in the judgment separately, he said that you have a similar situation here. It's striking how analytically similar the marijuana case is to the wheat case because you have a conceitedly valid overarching regulatory scheme, namely no marijuana for recreational use. Right? It was conceded that that was a constitutional exercise of the commerce power, and the court said that marijuana is fungible. It's not like medical marijuana looks any different than recreational marijuana, and the court was concerned about undermining federal drug laws, having people um, grow it, use it for medical purposes, but then give it to people uh, for use in the interstate, uh, for selling it in the interstate drug market. I think the, the most devastating part of the oral argument, I think the, the point at which the case was won by the government, was when the Solicitor General Paul Clement told the court during his rebuttal that you have cases throughout the intermediate and appellate courts in California in which someone is caught with a whole lot of marijuana and a scale and claims medical marijuana and the courts are having to adjudicate it. And that's the kind of undermining that I think the court, uh, the court was, was concerned about. A more recent case, Gonzalez against Oregon, dealt with assisted suicide. And here the court held that federal drug law did not allow then Attorney General Ashcroft to interpret federal drug law to put an end to the state of Oregon's experiment with assisted suicide. It's a 10-year-old Death with Dignity Act, the only law of this kind in the country. And Attorney General Ashcroft reversed the decision by Janet Reno to allow uh, the experiment to, to unfold. And he said that you can't use federally controlled substances unless it's for a legitimate medical purpose. And aiding a suicide is not a legitimate medical purpose. It violates uh, medical ethics going back to uh, Hippocrates. And what, what the court said was not that there is or isn't a fundamental right to assisted suicide, not that Congress couldn't regulate assisted suicide if it wanted to, but that in fact when Congress wrote the drug laws several decades ago, it wasn't intending to put an end to the robust, uh, politically charged, uh, ethically and religiously charged debate within the country on physician assisted suicide. So unlike the Raich case, this was not, th th this was an issue of statutory interpretation. What did Congress intend? Not a question of constitutional law. Many people who are critical of the decisions have accused the court of inconsistency or hypocrisy, saying the federal government can regulate when it likes what it's regulating drugs, but it can't regulate when it doesn't like what it's regulating, namely physician-assisted suicide. I think that misses a key distinction between the cases, constitutional law versus statutory construction. Um, I think it's also interesting to see the, the dynamic between the court and the political branches. In the Glucksburg case in 97, the court declined to find a fundamental right for physician-assisted suicide, saying that the issue was one that should be left to the states. 
keep that in mind, because what happened is that the issue was attempted to be federalized, but in the other direction by the Attorney General, saying that no one anywhere on the state level could ha exercise this right, even if state law allowed it. Keep that in mind towards the end of the hour when we talk about abortion. Throughout American history, the Supreme Court has shifted between two different perspectives about federalism and the relation between the federal government and the states. One I'd call a nationalist perspective that seeks to broadly define the powers of the federal government to deal with social problems and rejects the idea that the existence of states is a limit on national authority. The other is a federalist perspective that says that states are sovereign entities, that the authority of the federal government needs to be limited so as to protect the prerogatives of states. From early in the 19th century to late in the 19th century, the Supreme Court took the nationalist perspective. Not one federal law was struck down as exceeding the scope of Congress's powers. And then from the 1890s through 1936, the court took the federalist perspective, striking down many laws as exceeding the scope of Congress's Commerce Clause authority, its spending power, violating the Tenth Amendment. Much New Deal legislation was invalidated in the 1930s on federalism grounds. Then, from 1937 until the 1990s, the court swung back to the nationalist perspective. Over that time, now one federal law was invalidated for exceeding the scope of Congress's Commerce Clause authority. Only one case found a violation of the Tenth Amendment, and that decision was overruled less than a decade later. In the 1990s, the Supreme Court came back to the federalist perspective. I have no doubt that when constitutional historians look back at the Rehnquist Court, they will say that its greatest changes in constitutional law with regard to federalism. The court limited the scope of Congress's commerce power, restricted the ability of Congress to adopt laws under the 14th Amendment, revived the 10th Amendment as a limit on federal power, greatly expanded the scope of sovereign immunity. Almost every one of these decisions was by a 5-4 margin. I think one of the effects of the November 2004 presidential election was in determining whether or not the federalist model was going to continue, whether the court would go back to the nationalist perspective. I have no doubt that if John Kerry had won in November of 2004 and had appointed the replacements for Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice O'Connor, those justices would have shifted back to the nationalist perspective and the Rehnquist era of federalism revolution would have quickly been undone. But now, with Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito on the court, I think that we're going to stay in the federalist era for decades to come. And perhaps the most important place where we'll see that, and maybe soon, is with regard to federal environmental laws. Every federal environmental statute was adopted by Congress under its Commerce Clause authority. Many of these laws are now being challenged as exceeding the scope of Congress's power. There's one such case before the Supreme Court right now. It's a case called Rapanos versus United States. It involves whether the Federal Clean Water Act can be applied to intrastate wetlands that ultimately connect to interstate waters. The Federal Water Pollution Control Act says that pollutants can't be put in interstate waters. But can that authority extend so far as intrastate wetlands? Those who defend this say protecting the nation's water supply is a national problem and it requires a national solution. Environmental problems aren't confined to a single state. One state's choices affect the entire country. But challenge the law say it's one thing for Congress to regulate interstate waters, but when it comes to intrastate waters or wetlands, that's the prerogative of state governments. The case was argued at the Supreme Court a couple of months ago, decided by the end of June. Justice Alito did participate. So it might give us first indication of his views as to federalism on the Supreme Court. And if the Supreme Court invalidates this law, then many federal environmental statutes will be vulnerable. Think of the Endangered Species Act. Can Congress, under its Commerce Clause power, regulate a species that's indigenous to one state that doesn't cross state lines? John Roberts wrote an opinion when a judge on the DC Circuit questioning the constitutionality of the Endangered Species Act. It and many environmental laws might put in jeopardy in the years ahead. Anything? Want to go on to the next topic? Yeah. <laughs> this, 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 I'm going to have to uh, 
not indulge my desires. <laughs> Please. Why can't the <coughs> scholars who understand how interventionist this trend by the Supreme Court really is, I'm thinking of the Violence Against Women Act and other laws that <coughs> 30 years ago there wouldn't have been a close question about whether Congress had the power to act. Why, why can't this issue get translated for the public a little better? Because the public has no understanding of what this trend toward federalism really means. I think that's right. I think, for example, one of the aspects of federalism that we didn't talk about this morning is the tremendous growth in sovereign immunity. What this means is there are instances where people have constitutional or statutory rights and there is no court they can sue in. The Supreme Court, for example, said if a state violates patents or copyrights, the state can't be sued in federal or state court. Imagine a hypothetical Duke Law professor who's written a few books that are often used by law students. <laughs> and imagine that um, some state university downloads the books, digitizes them, and makes them available for free for their students. Um, and imagine that that professor saving the royalties for his hypothetical four children's college education. <laughs> He's out of luck. He can't sue the state. Now, we don't get that much in royalties. But I've heard of a multi-million, <laughs> we really don't. Yet but you I've always of, worked at private schools. Uh, but I've heard of the University of, a case against the University of Texas for a multi-million dollar patent infringement claim being dismissed on sovereign immunity grounds. That's the consequences of this. I think this area of law has proved least accessible to the public, and I think those who deserve blame are the law professors, because we're the ones who should be out there writing the op-ed pieces or giving talks to the public to explain this. Now, there's competing views, but I don't think either side of the ideological spectrum has done a very good job of explaining his views on this issue. I think this is an area where if the public understood what's at stake, and again, I come back to the Violence Against Women Act, which I thought was an incredible distortion of the federalist doctrine. I think the public would react, but the only, the only people in the country, that, I mean columnists are not interested in this, law professors could make this translation possible. And I think we should do more. Yeah, I, I, I would like to agree with you. I'd like to live in a country in which that was the case. I don't think that's the country we live in. I don't think the country is at the ready to be informed about the consequences of federalism doctrine for the country, and the law professors aren't telling them. There have been law professors screaming bloody murder about the consequences of federalism doctrine, and people aren't interested. It wasn't a big issue at the confirmation hearings because people aren't interested. There's a reason why they're not interested yet. It's because the Rehnquist court has been scrupulous about its interventions. Guns in schools is not a big deal. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is a big deal. Right? The Family Medical Leave Act, the court upholds it, a big deal. Right? The Violence Against Women Act, you're talking about a private civil remedy. Right? That, that, it's not something that's going to really grab the country. So I think it's been a significant change in federalism doctrine, but the court has been very careful about its interventions. And right now, the court has not knocked the pins out from under the nation's environmental laws. If it did that, well, that would be an issue that would get some attention, although the political climate has changed. Right? There's not the solicitude for environmental laws that there used to be. So I think part of this is that John Roberts can talk about humility and modesty and restraint, while every indication is he endorses emphatically the court's federalism interventions, um, because the public doesn't care about this nearly as much as they care about abortion, gay marriage, affirmative action, those sorts of issues. The second area we wanted to talk about concerns criminal procedure. And I want to focus on one important change in the law of criminal procedure over the last few years, and one that hasn't gotten media attention, and that's the change in the court's attitude towards the death penalty. If you look at the Rehnquist Court from 1986, when William Rehnquist became Chief Justice, until 2002, you'll scarcely find an instance where the Rehnquist Court overturned a death sentence, and you won't find any instances where the Supreme Court articulated major limits on the ability of the government to impose capital punishment. 
But over the last few years, the Rehnquist Court has imposed a number of major limits on the ability to use the death penalty and overturned a number of death sentences. Let me give you examples of this, talk about why I think this has happened, and talk about what the future might hold. As you may remember, in the year 2002, in a case called Atkins versus Virginia, the Supreme Court said that it was cruel and unusual punishment in violation of the Eighth Amendment to impose the death penalty on a mentally retarded individual. That was a six to three decision with only Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice Scalia and Thomas dissenting. And just last year in 2005, in a case called Roper versus Simmons, the Supreme Court in a five to four ruling said that it was cruel and unusual punishment to impose the death penalty on individuals who were juveniles when they committed their crime. The five in the majority there were Justices Stevens, Souter, Ginsburg, Breyer, and Kennedy, so there's no reason to believe that this decision will be reconsidered in light of the change in the composition of the court. There are other areas, too, where the court overturned death sentences. For instance, from 1986 until 2003, there was not one case where the Supreme Court overruled the death sentence for ineffective assistance of counsel. The last couple of years, there were two. In a case called Wiggins versus Smith in 2003, the Supreme Court, by a 7 to 2 margin, overturned a death sentence in the state of Virginia. A man had been convicted of murder and sentenced to death. The Supreme Court, though, found that there was ineffective assistance of counsel because the defense lawyer never investigated whether the defendant had been abused as a child, never presented as mitigating circumstances horror abuse that was later discovered. And just last June, in a case called Rumpilla versus Beard, the court, by a 5-4 decision, overturned a death sentence for ineffective assistance counsel. Rumpilla is a particularly interesting case because the opinion for the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit upholding the death sentence was written by then Judge Samuel Alito. The Supreme Court overturned Judge Alito's decision in a 5-4 decision with Justice Sandra Day O'Connor in the majority. So it's an indication of how things might have been different. When Pilla versus Beard wasn't the lawyer who slept through a trial like we've seen in some parts of the country, it was a very conscientious lawyer. But the lawyer never went and read the file from a prior rape conviction from the defendant. Had the lawyer read the file, he would come up with important rebuttal evidence. The Supreme Court, in a 5-4 decision, said the failure of defense counsel to go and read a file from the prior case was ineffective assistance of counsel. I can point to other instances in just the last couple of years where the Supreme Court overturned death sentences. In one case, the court overturned a death sentence because the defendant was in prison clothes at the time of the penalty phase of the trial. Another case coming out of Texas, the court overturned a death sentence for bias in jury selection. Why this shift? I think it's because we've had an increasing number of justices on the court concerned about the way the death penalty is administered in the United States. Now, I don't think any of the justices on the current court would take the position that capital punishment is inherently cruel and unusual punishment. But they are concerned about the death penalty is administered. Justice Ginsburg gave a speech at the University of District Columbia in the summer of 2001 where she said she's never seen as a judge a death penalty case without significant evidence of ineffective assistance of counsel. Justice O'Connor gave a speech in the summer of 2002 in Minnesota where she expressed similar sentiments and talked about the lack of adequate representation and ancillary services for those who are facing death sentences. Justice Stevens gave a speech at the American Bar Association Convention in Chicago last summer. Some of you have been there. We again express concern about the lack of effective representation in death penalty cases. So I think we've come to have a majority of the court that wants to try to do more to perfect the way the death penalty is administered in the United States. Now with Justice O'Connor leaving, being replaced by Justice Alito, perhaps the court will be less concerned about this. But I do think there's a significant trend in the last few years with the court overturning death sentences and be concerned about how the death penalty is administered in the United States. This is one area where, for as long as Justice Stevens remains on the court, Justice Kennedy is going to make the law. 
I think there are examples in which Justice Kennedy finds violations of the Eighth and Fourteenth Amendment. Rumpilla is the case uh, in which Justice Kennedy was with, uh, with the other conservatives in dissent, and Justice O'Connor O'Connor wrote the law. We should understand that Justice Stevens um, is just turned 86. Um, he's in very good health. His mind is sharp as a tack, but he just turned 86. If Justice Stevens is replaced by the current administration or the next administration, if the Republicans win the next election, you're talking about the political center of the gravity of the, on the court being not Justice Kennedy, but Justice Roberts and Justice Alito. Right? Then I think you're talking about not just a significant shift, but a full-scale uh, constitutional revolution. I don't think that's, that's um, really much, uh, much of an overstatement. So we should keep that in mind that uh, people are concerned about uh, the shifts in the court now. Well, it's really nothing compared to what, what the future might bring. I think there's another reason why the court has become increasingly concerned about the death penalty. And I think Irwin is right that it's, the debate is not at the philosophical level of what does a society that values life do with respect to the death penalty. Do, do we say that the state can't kill people, period? Or do we say that the most heinous crimes deserve the, the, the greatest possible punishment? It's really at the level of implementation. I think Justice O'Connor has her concerns. I think Justice Kennedy has his concerns, and not always the same concerns. And I think it's, it's likely that Justice O'Connor has been replaced with a justice uh, who's likely to have less concerns. I think that the evidence in Rumpilla and other cases is that Justice Alito feels differently. I think another reason besides concerns about implementation is what's been going on in the lower courts for the last 11 years. Right? You had the Rehnquist Court together, stable for 11 years. During that time, you had substantial turnover in the federal courts of appeals. And they've been gradually becoming uh, more and more conservative on the issue of the death penalty. And you see, uh, again, not a lot of media attention, but pretty remarkable events in fights between the U.S. Supreme Court and the lower courts. One of the cases that Erwin mentioned is the miller -El case coming out of the Fifth Circuit in New Orleans. This was a case that uh, went to the Supreme Court twice. Right? The first time, the Fifth Circuit denied what's called a certificate of appealability saying there wasn't even a substantial claim of racial discrimination in jury selection, and you can't even bring the, bring the case forward, the court reversed that eight to one and said you have to allow this claim to go forward. Only Justice Thomas dissents. Then on remand, the Fifth Circuit reinstates its previous opinion on the merits, writing verbatim copying Justice Thomas's solo dissent. <laughs> going back, um, going back, um, the case goes back to the Supreme Court. This time, it's... 6-3, uh, the court reverses. Justice Souter, and very rare for him, using language um, strongly suggesting uh, intransigence, impotence on the part of the Court of Appeals. It's a case in which you have 10 of the 11 eligible African Americans in the jury pool being excluded, um, even though whites who were asked the same questions weren't excluded. You had a prosecutor's office in Dallas that had a long history and a policy manual saying exclude African Americans and Jews from the jury in, race, in, in capital cases because they won't vote for a death sentence. It's, you had a jury shuffle in which when the African American gets to the front of the line, they're put at the back of the line. So I mean, you had uh, very strong evidence of racial discrimination in jury selection. Uh, uh, some members of the court disagreed. This caused Justice Breyer to say that, look, if this is not enough, we really shouldn't have peremptory strikes anymore. Right? If it, e either, you have, e either you have this sort of judicial review of these peremptory challenges, or you don't. But if this is not enough evidence of racial discrimination in jury selection, then really nothing is. And I think so this is, this is an example of um, lower courts moving in a significantly different direction. And people on the Supreme Court who are, um, Justice O'Connor, Justice Kennedy have, have routinely deny last minute stays of applica uh, stay applications. Actually, so do the liberals on the court in death cases. Right? This is not about sort of each case um, they're being very concerned about imposition of the death penalty. But I think for them, this is too much, what the lower courts are doing uh, in, in, in capital cases. The third area that we want to talk about concerned the First Amendment. Well, it's, uh, it's actually appropriate because I want to talk about religion and separation of church and state. Just got the timing a little bit wrong on that. <laughs> I do think that the area of the First Amendment where we're going to see the greatest changes is with regard to the Establishment Clause. In fact, of all of the areas of constitutional law 
the one where I'm most confident in predicting there's going to be a major change is with regard to the provision of the First Amendment that says there should be no law respecting the establishment of religion. <laughs> in recent years, the Supreme Court has been split five to four between two very different views of the Establishment Clause. One adheres to the view that's prevailed for over a half century that the Establishment Clause is about there being a wall that separates church and state. Now, justices may differ as to the test that they want, but they adhere to the metaphor that comes from Thomas Jefferson long ago that there should be a wall that separates church and state. The other view that four justices have taken is that there's no such thing as a wall that separates church and state, that we should accommodate religion with government. Their view is that the government violates the Establishment Clause only if it literally establishes a church or coerces religious participation. We saw this split on a 5-4 basis in a couple of cases that were decided by the Supreme Court on June 27th of last year. Both involved Ten Commandments displays on government property. Both got a great deal of media attention. One was McCreary County, Kentucky versus ACLU of Kentucky. It involves a county in Kentucky that passed a resolution that declared that we're a Christian nation and as part of that, one of the Ten Commandments posted in county buildings. Not surprisingly, the American Civil Liberties Union brought a challenge to that. The county then said everywhere the Ten Commandments were posted, they wanted nine other displays about the role of religion in American history, all similarly framed, all of the same size. One just had the words, in God we trust. Another had the religious language from the Declaration of Independence. The Supreme Court, in a five to four decision, declared that unconstitutional. Justice Souter wrote for the court, joined by Justice Stevens, Justice Ginsburg, Justice Breyer, and Justice O'Connor. Justice Souter said that the government violates the Establishment Clause if it acts with the purpose of advancing religion, or if its primary effect is to advance religion, or if there's excess of government entangled with religion. He said the government's purpose here was clearly to advance religion, so this violates the Establishment Clause. The four dissenting justices disagreed with the test and its application. They said that they believed that no religious symbol on government property would ever violate the Establishment Clause, so long as the government doesn't literally establish a church or coerce religious participation. It doesn't violate the Establishment Clause. The other case decided the same day was Van Orden versus Perry. It involves a six-foot-high, three-foot-wide Ten Commandments monument that sits directly at the corner of the Texas State Capitol and the Texas Supreme Court. I had the privilege of arguing Van Orden versus Perry in the Supreme Court last year. And I'll tell you, from the moment that Thomas Van Orden called me and asked me to take his case, to when I was writing the cert petition, so when I stood before the justice on March 2nd last year, I was absolutely convinced that Sandra O'Connor was going to be the swing vote. My brief was a shameless attempt to pander to Justice O'Connor. <laughs> if I could have put Sandra O'Connor's picture on the front of my brief, I would have done so. <laughs> Thus, I was not surprised when I learned that I had lost five to four. I was shocked to find out that I got Justice O'Connor's vote but lost because Justice Breyer concurred in the judgment. Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice Scalia, Kennedy, and Thomas predictably took the position that religious symbols on government property don't violate the Establishment Clause. Justice Breyer said he agreed with the dissent that the government can't endorse religion with its symbols, but he said this didn't do so because it had been there since 1961 without objection, because it had been donated by the Fraternal Order of Eagles, because there were a lot of other symbols present on government property. The reality is that these two cases did not change the law of the Establishment Clause. Five justices continue to adhere to the test that's been followed since 1971. Five justices continue to say the government can't put religious symbols on government property if they endorse religion. But four justices were there to take a very different view. Justice Scalia and Kennedy and Thomas remain on the court. Based on their earlier writings and opinions, I think that Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito will agree with them. I think you will see a radical change in the law in this area. It will mean, for example, any religious symbols on government property anywhere okay. 
it will mean that the government give whatever aid it wants to parochial school, including for religious instruction, so long as the government doesn't discriminate among religions. This is the place where I predict you'll see, not this year, but maybe next in the years after, a real sea shift in constitutional law. Overall, I think Van Oren and McCreary County are strong victories for church-state separation because of the narrowness of Justice Breyer's concurrence in the judgment in Van Orden. I also think the victory is going to be very short-lived. Um, I agree with Irwin that this is going to be an area in which you're going to see radical change in the law. The court has had four votes to explicitly overrule Lemon. It has never had a fifth in all likelihood. Um, in fact, I would say it's overwhelmingly likely they do have a fifth now in Justice Alito. Isn't it curious that the Democrats made almost no mention of the Establishment Clause and church-state separation during both of the recent confirmation hearings, despite how likely it is that the law is going to significantly change here? And I think that tells you something about uh, the political situation as the Democrats understand it, which is this issue is a loser for us because most of the American people agree with the conservatives on the court who want to overrule um, who want to overrule the lemon test. I think that's part of uh, the political reality of the situation as, as, the Democratic senators, uh, as the Democratic senators see it. And so I think there will be uh, certainly quite a number of constitutional law professors who will be concerned when they see the law change. I'm not so sure that uh, this is going to be an issue uh, like federalism that's going to uh, grab the public's concern um, because I think there's more of a correspondence between how the public feels about these issues than on how a lot of the um, legal academics do. Justice Breyer said a lot more than Erwin mentioned in his opinion in Van Orden, and, and, and it really raises pretty profound issues about judicial role and judicial craft. Uh, Justice Breyer was unusually candid. Um, he said, I agree with the Lemon test. I agree with the Stevens uh, O'Connor, Ginsburg, Souter view of the Establishment Clause. I just disagree with the application here. He also said, I'm very concerned about divisiveness. I'm very concerned about if we strike down this display, the ACLU bringing lawsuits all around the country, striking down all sorts of other displays. Right? He was, um, some would say, delightfully candid or pragmatic. Other would say, others would say, really much more candid than he should have been. Right? I think there is a reasonable debate within constitutional law about circumstances in which justices should be responsive to public reaction, public opinion. Think of name versus name, a case in which the court declined to hear a challenge to Virginia's anti-miscegenation statute in the wake of Brown for want of a substantial federal question. Right? Give me a break. Um, the court was concerned about the country not buying into Brown because people were saying, first they're going to integrate the schools and then they're going to be marrying our children. Right? The court was very concerned about this. We know this now from the court's papers. I think Justice Breyer had real concerns about divisiveness over religion. And the message from his opinion is, if the display's been there for a long time, ACLU, leave it alone. If the display hasn't been there for a long time and isn't there yet, religious right, don't start putting them there because they're going to be unconstitutional. Right? Again, reasonable people can disagree about whether it makes sense for justices in extraordinary cases to take those kinds of considerations into account. I think it's much more questionable whether a justice, if he or she does that, should be so explicit about it on the face of the opinion. There's a certain self-undermining quality to it in saying what's really moving me and what's really not moving me. I agree with the test, but I don't agree with the application, but I sort of agree with the application. I'm just going to sort of squint and and look at the monument a little differently because I'm concerned about the consequences of, of invalidating this monument. You know, it's six by three. It's right between the State House and the Capitol grounds. It's the most prominent monument. And it says, I am the Lord thy God in huge letters. Right? It's one thing to say that's not an Establishment Clause violation because I don't agree with the Lemon Test. But to say you do agree with the Lemon Test, and that's not an Establishment Clause violation, and then to say so explicitly on the face of the opinion why you're being moved in that direction, seems to me to raise serious questions about, um, about, uh, about a, judge's, a judge's proper role. I want to mention one area in which Justice Alito is going to be much more likely to be like Justice Souter than Justice Scalia. And that's on the other half of the religion jurisprudence, the free exercise clause. Justice Scalia is not at all solicitous of free exercise claims. He says, as long as you have a neutral law of general applicability, 
it doesn't matter that it seriously burdens religious practice. Right? Overwhelmingly, these are religious minorities because religious majorities don't pass laws that burden their free exercise of religion. Justice Souter is very concerned about this. So is Justice Alito. I think Justice Alito's free exercise jurisprudence is going to be much more like some of the people on the left side of the court than it is uh, Justice Scalia. Should we take questions? Yes. Rather than, why don't we use the remaining time just to take questions that you have? We have about 10 minutes left. Please. Could you reconcile for us the uh, decision in Gonzalez versus Reich and Gonzalez versus Ocentro, both dealing with the uh, use of drugs, but having different results? Completely different issues were presented. Neil did a terrific job presenting Gonzalez versus Reich, and what that considered was, does Congress have the authority under the Commerce Clause to criminally prohibit and punish cultivation of small amounts of marijuana? The case that you mentioned, Gonzalez versus Centra, involves a very small religion. It has about 150 adherents and comes from the Brazilian rainforest. They make a tea that includes a hallucinogenic substance that's prohibited under the Controlled Substance Act. They brought a lawsuit for a declaratory judgment saying that to apply the Controlled Substance Act to them violated their rights under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act is a statute that Congress adopted in 1993 to overrule a Supreme Court case that Neil alluded to. And the Religious Freedom Restoration Act says, whenever the government significantly burdens religion, the government has to show that its action is necessary to achieve a compelling government purpose. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act was struck down as applies to state and local governments as exceeding Congress' power, but it's been applied to the federal government. Well, the issue in this case is, does the government meet strict scrutiny? Is its action necessary to achieve a compelling interest when it keeps this very small religion from making this tea? And the Supreme Court, in an opinion by Chief Justice Roberts, ruled in favor of the religion. He said that the government couldn't show allowing this small group of people to make their tea in any way was likely to undermine federal drug laws. Well, what's the difference between the two cases? You have a specific statutory right in the Ocentro case. You had no specific statutory right in Raich. Also, in Raich, the government had a credible argument that allowing homegrown marijuana could fuel the interstate marijuana market and lead to contraband. The government didn't have a credible argument, according to the Supreme Court, that allowing this tiny religion to make its tea was going to undermine federal drug laws. I should just add that we have some of the tea outside for you to sample. <laughs> How, far of a, how much of the chipping away of abortion rights do you see under this court? That's uh, a great question. If we had time, we would have gotten there in the presentation. I think, again, it depends on what you mean by this court. Yes. If, right, I mean... Robert court. Right. It, it, it depends critically on who replaces Justice Stevens. Okay? Mm -hmm. Just thinking about the court we have now, Justice Kennedy is going to make the law. Okay? Justice Kennedy has declined uh, to vote to overturn uh, Roe versus Wade, right? There aren't five votes to overturn Roe versus Wade. Um, but he also is very conflicted about abortion, initially voted to overrule Roe in 92 in Planned Parenthood against Casey. And in fact, there was a majority opinion circulated overruling Roe. Um, he also, I think, is prepared to uphold just about every regulation of abortion that's going to be presented to the court. So I think it was a pragmatic compromise on his part, not overruling Roe, but allowing uh, quite a lot of regulations of abortion. Justice O'Connor and Justice Alito are very different. Justice O'Connor insisted on health exceptions. Right? She, ex she insisted on protecting, uh, on protecting the welfare uh, of the woman. There's no indication and a lot of indication that Justice Alito is going to see this very differently. I think in the near term, the issue is not are they going to overrule Roe. I think it's much more the death by a thousand cuts situation in which they're going to consistently get greater and greater restrictions on abortion being presented to the court, and the court is going to uphold them. 24-hour waiting period, 48-hour waiting period, one-week waiting period, no health exception, no life exception, all sorts of ways in which abortion rights can be limited without Roe being overruled. And the court knows very well how to not formally overrule precedents, but whittle them down uh, to, to, to mean very little. And that would be one way to do that without taking the political the political flag for having overruled Roe. Yeah, 
that all stand up, do you think? Well, I don't think so with the current nine justices. And I think right now abortion rights in this country depend on both of two factors. The health of an 86-year-old justice and a justice who's previously voted to overrule Roe versus Wade. The reason I say that is I think that there are four votes on the current court to overrule Roe. We know Justice Scalia and Thomas will do so as soon as they have the chance to do so. They've said so repeatedly. Having read the prior writings of Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito, I have zero doubt that they will vote to overrule Roe. I know that it's been referred to by Chief Justice Roberts as super precedent or super duper precedent. <laughs> I don't think it's going to have the slightest effect on how they're going to vote when the issue comes before them. Now, in the current court, there are four justices who have consistently supported abortion rights, and that's Justices Stevens, Souter, Ginsburg, and Breyer. And we've all remarked on the age of Justice Stevens as being in great health, but he is 86 years old. Justice Kennedy is harder to predict. In 1989, in the first abortion case he participated in, Webster versus Reproductive Health Services, he voted to overrule Roe versus Wade. In 1992, in Casey, when it first went to conference, we know because of Justice Blackmun's papers, he voted to overrule Roe versus Wade. But then he voted to affirm Roe versus Wade. My conclusion is the same as Neil's. Right now, there are five justices to uphold a right to abortion under the Constitution. Stephen, Souter, Ginsburg, Breyer, and Kennedy. So that means the South Dakota law prohibiting all abortions would be unconstitutional. In fact, I think if the current nine justices remain, when that case gets there, the court won't even take it. The federal district court will strike it down, the Eighth Circuit will affirm, and that will be the end of it. But I think there are five justices to allow much more government regulation of abortion. Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Scalia, Thomas, um, Alito, and Kennedy. And I think we'll see this next term where there's a case before the Supreme Court involving a federal law prohibiting so-called partial birth abortions. The Supreme Court in the year 2000, in a case called Stenberg versus Carhart, voted five to four to strike down a similar state statute. There was Stevens, Souter, Ginsburg, Breyer, and O'Connor. And I think we'll see when this case is argued to the Supreme Court next fall and decided next year that the court's likely to come out differently. So, and it is, right now the court's not going to overrule Roe, but I think they are going to allow much more in the way of government regulation of abortion. Please. Is the uh, relationship between Justices Ginsburg and Scalia as strong as it used to be? And does Chief Justice Roberts have any special friends on the court? <laughs> uh, to your uh, first question, yes. And uh, as for your second question, I can tell you that uh, he's very popular. Um, he was very popular before he was nominated as one of uh, anyone's very short list of the best Supreme Court advocates in the country. Uh, Justice Ginsburg, after argument, likes to walk back to chambers with her clerks and talk about the advocates. And she loved to talk about John Roberts. Um, so I think, I, I don't think he's been long enough to, to be, have special, you know, be, have, be special friends with anyone. But I do think um, if anyone could pull off coming in as the junior justice and be chief justice, Right? It could be him because of how much respect they have for him as a, as a lawyer uh, and as a, as a Supreme Court advocate. Please. Uh, just a question for both of you. I was struck by Professor Siegel's comment about Justice Breyer and his, um, <coughs> in, in the religious case and, and how his comments may be tendered to underline, undermine public confidence in the law. And I, I wonder um, about your views about the fact that the fundamental law of our country, the Constitution, on so many fundamental aspects, as some of it's been discussed today, and, and there are others, of course, in the public's mind, seem to be subject to change and, in effect, de facto amendment by who sits, by who has a five to four majority on an unelected Supreme Court. Um, and I think basically that. That, uh, that struck me uh, from all of you, the comments today, how, and, and how the pub, you think the public reacts to that and whether that's healthy in a democracy. I think the public understands that the Constitution is written in very broad, open-textured language. And the public understands that throughout American history, 
the Supreme Court has to give meaning to that language. And the meaning changes over time, and it changes the identity of the justices change. We saw that in 1987 when Robert Bork was nominated for the Supreme Court. The opposition to him was that he didn't believe in a right to privacy under the Constitution. He didn't believe that equal protection outlawed gender discrimination. He didn't believe that the First Amendment applied to other than political speech. And opinion polls showed overwhelming opposition to Robert Bork because of those views. It wasn't that people believe that there is a right to privacy written in the Constitution. It isn't that they believe that the Constitution mentions gender discrimination. It's that they understand that the court is giving meaning to these broad phrases, and they like the way in which those decisions gave meaning to it. When Bush versus Gore was decided by the Supreme Court on December 12, 2000, I got asked by countless reporters, isn't this going to undermine public confidence in the Supreme Court? And I said, not at all. I said, people understand that the Supreme Court had to make a choice, and that undoubtedly the choice they made was affected by the views of the individual justices. And sure enough, I've now done the research and found that if you look at the Gallup polls, the Supreme Court's public approval rating was identical in June of 2001 as it was in September of 2000. It had gone up a bit among Republicans and down a bit among Democrats, <laughs> but it was the same. I think people understand that justices make choices, and the choices they make is a function of who's on the court. It's been that way throughout American history. This is a place where I think that people know this is an emperor that has no clothes. If what we mean is that there's just a law that's out there to be discovered by the justice and applied in a mechanical way. I, as, as a sociological or descriptive matter, I would disagree with Erwin. Right? I don't think the public understands. I think if they did, John Roberts couldn't stare the American public in the face and say, I just want to be an umpire. I just want to call balls and strikes. No one goes to a ball game to watch the umpire. Right? Well, why are you the legal equivalent of a major league pitcher giving up your multi-million dollar salary to become an umpire? Right? People didn't, people, that was, that was very effective. It was very politically effective. People were taken in by it. No one noticed that it completely undermined his refusal to answer questions. All we want to know is row a strike or is it a ball? What's the big deal? Right? So I don't think the public really understands that justices make these choices. I think they aspire to the Roberts vision of the umpire, of the difference between law and politics. And I think you ask a profound question because I do think there's a difference. Um, but at the same time, the public, the public is also very pragmatic and they want what they want. They just happen to think that what they want is what the Constitution requires and they like being told that, <laughs> right? It's sort of, it's, this, is the, this is the law and it means certain things about abortion and about gay rights and about affirmative action and all the judges are doing are being umpires and interpreting the law. Um, so it's, it's a very complicated dynamic between, between law and politics, between principle and pragmatism. I think Irwin is describing a lot of the reality, not all of it, because I do think there's a difference. And I do think some justices do a better job than others in deciding cases not the way they would like to if they were king uh, than others. Um, but nevertheless, there, there, there's an irreducible political content to constitutional law. It doesn't come from out there. The only reason the country historically increasingly has signed on to what the court does as a counter-majoritarian institution in an otherwise democratic society is because of agree uh, basic agreement with where the court is taking the country. Right? When, there's a, when there's a radical disconnect between the political center of gravity on the court and the country, crises ensue. And it's happened. It's happened with respect to Dred Scott and the Civil War. It happened in 1937 with respect to the New Deal. Right? It could happen again. We've used our hours, so I think at this point we should say thank you so much for coming this morning.